teaching beds for I don't know, probably 13 or 14 years now. And I've done a lot of permaculture, but five, five or so years ago, I decided I wanted to learn a bit more about the science of things, how things grow, and sort of work out what I was being told was just sort of pop culture or folklore and, and what really happened. So I went off to Charles Sturt Uni and did a Bachelor of Horticulture. And then following that had the opportunity to, to do an honours degree and decided I'd like to do some research into wicking beds. One of the things I'd come to think after doing a bit of soil science and learning a bit about how uh, water moved through soil was I didn't understand when you've got gravel with big spaces between the gravel, how water actually wicked up in, through that. And when most of the wicking bed designs are saying put gravel in the reservoir, I didn't understand how they were working. So I thought, let's go and do a little bit of research and, and try and answer that question for me and see what is the best way of doing at least the reservoir layer in, in a wicking bed. So that's what set me off on this journey. I now think I've got some understanding of what's happening inside wicking beds. I certainly don't know all the answers and don't know everything there is to know about constructing wicking beds, but it's at least a start and might prompt some discussion and might prompt some, some further research. So I'd be pretty sure that everybody that's listening today would know about wicking beds, but I thought it's worth just doing a quick overview of what is a wicking bed, just so that we're all on, on the same page. So wicking beds are a growing, sealed growing container that's got a water reservoir in the bottom portion of it and a growing medium in the upper portion. And you fill the, um, the reservoir up through, through a fill tube, so you're generally not putting water onto the top of the wicking bed, you just put it in underneath and then water wicks up by capillary action from the reservoir to the soil and into the plant's roots. And they generally have an overflow part of the way up so that the uh, growing medium doesn't get saturated. The pictures down the right hand side are just some of the wicking beds I've got here at the farm that I've been growing for for quite a while. And I've, I've used various different ways over the years of constructing those. And some things have worked and some things haven't worked real well, but there's not been a lot of method until I started these experiments, not a huge amount of method in, in doing things rigorously. The, probably the biggest failure I've had in, in wicking beds was some of the early ones I did. I put a mixture of, I think I, had gravel down in the in the base of them, but then used a mixture of just compost and um, potting mix above that. And that where it was saturated, um, it really just start, broke down fairly quickly. And after a couple of years, what was down towards the reservoir layer, it just sort of turned to black sludge and wasn't really a very nice thing for growing plants in. So I've replaced that and I might talk about some of the other things I've, I've done instead. I started off looking at what had been published in, in the scientific literature. There's, there's a huge amount on the internet, on blogs and on YouTube about wicking beds, but it's really hard to tell what's just people's opinions and how much they really know about what's going on there. So, so I turned to the peer reviewed scientific literature and I only found three papers that talked about wicking beds. And they found there were some advantages to wicking beds compared to just normal above ground beds that they got better yields, they didn't need watering as often, they had better water use efficiency, so they used less water. Um, but all the experiments that have been done had gravel in the reservoir and some sort of growing medium above. And they found that the, the depth of the gravel didn't make much difference, whether it was 150 or 300 millimetres deep. And the depth of the soil didn't make a lot of difference either. But that still didn't answer the, the questions I had about whether gravel was in fact the, the best thing to use. I also looked at literature for hydroponics because 
Some of the hydroponic setups use what they call sub-irrigation, where they put water in at the bottom of the hydroponic pots and then water wicks up through the growing medium. So there, there was some useful information in there about what's used as, as growing media. But there's a few fundamental differences between the way hydroponics operates and the way wicking beds operate. As the hydroponics are generally done with a, what they call flood and drain, where they have a tray that the pots are sitting in and they fill the, the tray up with water for a while, let it wick up into the, the uh, soil in the pots, and then they drain the tray out. So then the pots get a chance to drain out and dry a bit. So they're not, they don't have a constant reservoir like um, wicking beds do. And as part of this, the growing media is often designed to, to drain fairly freely. Um, and generally it's growing in, people are growing things in smaller pots and not terribly deep pots for the hydroponics. They also have the, um, the fertiliser, the nutrients are supplied in the water rather than in the growing media. Most people growing wicking beds will put compost in and put fertiliser into the growing media, just put plain water into the reservoir. Now, I don't know whether, you know, what difference that makes yet uh, compared to hydroponics where the, the um, nutrients are, are in the, the water that wicks up from the bottom. But there, I think there, there are some useful things that we can learn from the, the research that's been done into hydroponics. So having seen what was out there and, and had been demonstrated already, I did a few experiments. The first one was just looking at how much water could various materials in the reservoir hold with the thought that the more water they hold, the longer they'll go between having to water the wicking beds, which is one of the big advantages of wicking beds. How well does water rise up through the reservoir material so it can get into the soil? So that was just a couple of experiments I'll talk about more, just in isolation, not actually in wicking beds. And then I built some wicking beds with different materials in the reservoir. And I did two different sorts of wicking beds, some quite large ones and some smaller ones. And I'll talk about the, the results of what I found there. Um, Ricky's just asked a question, do hydroponic or wicking beds tend to have better yields? I haven't seen any research that compares wicking beds with hydroponics. Um, hydroponics tends to be, certainly in a commercial setting, is managed very tightly about what moisture is in the growing medium and how much nutrients they're getting. And I think just because of that really close management, they're probably getting, getting better yields from, from most hydroponic setups than from wicking beds but they certainly require a lot more energy. They require a lot more management and a, a lot more maintenance than, than wicking beds do. But it's not something I've actually investigated in, in any detail. So my experiment with the water holding capacity uh, was a pretty simple one. I had some takeaway food containers. I filled them with the various materials and then measured how much water I could add to the container before it was completely full. The uh, things I tried were a cocoa peat mix, which I was using as my growing medium, which was a mix of cocoa peat, compost and sand. I used 10 millimetre diameter crushed gravel uh, that was a, a crushed basalt, a blue metal, call it. Some crusher dust, which is the same rock, but it's uh, crushed down quite fine. So it's got particles varying from very fine up to two or three millimetres. And it's typically used for uh, providing solid beds under paving or bedding in pipes, things like that. And the river gravel was again about 10 millimetres diameter, but they were rounded stones rather than the, the sharp ones that the crushed gravel. There were two different sorts of sand. One was called river sand, and one was called washed sand at the local soil yard where I got them. Um, I really don't have any information on what's the difference between them. Um, the wash sand was probably 
had slightly more finer particles in than the river sand, but I didn't actually measure uh, the particle size distribution in there. And then there was scoria that was sort of 10 to 15 millimetres diameter scoria. So it was, was reasonably small. It wasn't, wasn't the biggest scoria you can get. So I filled those all up with water and measured them. And this graph shows how much water they could hold. So the cocoa peat one held the most water. So I guess it was, was packed in fairly loosely. And that was um, one thing was a little hard to compare with how it would actually operate in a wicking bed where it might tend to be compressed a little bit more. So it may hold a little bit less water if it was actually in a wicking bed. But the uh, cocoa peat mix absorbed water as well. So it wasn't just the spaces between the cocoa peat particles that held water, it was actually inside the, inside the particles. So that was, was why it held the most water. The gravel <clears throat> did hold more water than the sand. The crushed gravel and the scoria were about the same. But there's not a huge difference, practically speaking, between the, the gravels and the sand. So, I mean, I thought if you had a reservoir full of gravel, it would have a lot more space in it for water than, than sand would, but um, the, the gravel was about 50% of water and the sand was 40%, which has a difference, but it's not a huge difference. The next thing I looked at was how well water wicked up through the various materials. Doing this, I had some clear perspex tubes that were 50 millimetres diameter, and I sat those in a container of water and then just measured <clears throat> every few hours how far up the, the column of material the water had gone. And you can see in that one, which would be cocoa peat, you see the where the colour changes, where it gets wet, and that would be sand, the colours up there. Um, and that one's crusher dust. So that gave me a, a measure of, of how high the water could rise and, and an indication of how, how fast it would rise. What I didn't measure there, but I think would be interesting to do is, is actually work, work out what is the volume of water that's rising up through the column. And that's probably something for, for further research. Before I go into the results of that, I thought it might be worth just talking a little bit about water and, and how capillary rise actually works, just so we've got a better understanding of, of why different materials might, might wick better than others. Water, I'm sure we all know, is H2O. It's, um, I've drawn this wrong. <laughs> It's, it's two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. And I've obviously had a brain fade when I've drawn the diagram. Anyway, uh, we, can, we can imagine it's the, labelled the other way around. But one of the, the interesting things about it is that it ends up being a, a molecule that's got a positive charge at one end of it and a negative charge at the other. And if you know from magnets, when you put two ends of magnets together, if they're opposite charge, they... Um, they will stick together and water molecules do the same. So they'll stick to each other, which we call cohesion, and they'll also stick to other things, to other surfaces, which we call adhesion. So if you've got water sitting in a container, a little bit of it will stick to the sides of the container and tend to rise up the sides a little bit. And that's where we get this men meniscus on the, uh, little curve going up from the water at the next, next to the container. Now, if the sides of the container are close enough together, as the water sticks to the side of the container and goes up a little bit, it will drag other water molecules up with it. And those water molecules will stick to other water molecules. And if the container is narrow enough, the water will, the whole water will rise all the way up the tube. Now it's got to be a pretty narrow tube for that to happen. Um, you know, it's maybe a millimetre, maybe less. Um, but it rises up the side until um, the, for the grab forces of gravity are, are holding it down. So the smaller the tube, the, the higher up the sides it's, it's going to rise. So what did I find 
in general, the fine materials had a greater rise. So the, the things with smaller particles packed in closer. And so the spaces between the particles or in effect these capillary tubes were smaller so that water could rise up them faster and, and further. So the crusher dust, which had the finest material in and had a good mix of sizes of materials, so it packed in fairly well. That's this purple line here. So it rose very fast and rose quite a long way. So my, my tubes were only 500 millimetres tall. Uh, so that was as high as, high as it would rise, as high as I could measure. But the crusher dust was, was still going up. The sand rose up fairly quickly, that's the red line, uh, until it was about 300 millimetres up. And then it slowed down, but it was still rising. And this immediately puts to bed one of the, the things that I commonly hear about wicking beds. Is, and I used to repeat myself when I was uh, running wicking bed courses because I'd read it so often that water will only wick, wick up 300, maximum of 300 millimetres. In fact, from the reading I did and what I've demonstrated, water, given the right sort of materials, will wick up a long way. And in fact, can wick up several metres. Um, so it's really, if you're wanting to get water to wick up a long way, it's a matter of having the right materials, but it's certainly not limited to 300 millimetres. The cocoa peat mix um, rose up to about 200 millimetres. But I did have troubles with that because starting off with a dry, it was as a lot of compost um, and organic materials tend to get when they dry out, they get a coating on the surface that makes them hydrophobic and not, and they won't absorb water or hang on to water until you get them really wet. So I think that the rise with the cocoa peat was probably affected a bit by it being dry and taking a long time to re-wet. I tried starting off with damp cocoa peat, but the problem was then I couldn't see any change in colour where the water had risen, risen to. So there's, there's another experimental technique there somewhere waiting to be developed that would, would let me actually see how fast the water rises in, in damp cocoa peat. But the really striking thing of this is, is that the, the things with larger particles, the gravel and the scoria, didn't really wick very well. The, the 10 millimetre crushed gravel, it eventually got up to about 110, 115 millimetres. The smooth river gravel got hardly any rise at all. And, and the scoria also had, had very little rise. So that tells me that using scoria or river gravel isn't going to be terribly successful in, in the reservoir layer of a wicking bed. So the water would wick up from, if you have a, a reservoir full of scoria, water will wick up a little bit from the, the top, top of the scoria into the soil, but as soon as the water level drops a bit, it's going to stop wicking, is, is what I would guess. As a question, the, so wicking limited by the size of your bed, wicking's better placed for smaller beds. If, it, it depends on, on what material you've got. If, um, if you've got a nice fine material with, with very small pores, um, you can, you could have a, have a deeper bed. My, the beds I made were, were 500 millimetres in total. So they had about 200 millimetres of, um, reservoir and 300 millimetres of soil. And I've, I've been using beds like that for a long time. And the water seems to wick up to the, the top of the soil quite happily in those. And I'm not sure for, certainly for growing veggies, you don't really need them any deeper than that. Um, but if you're growing trees in wicking beds, you may want to have, have deeper soil. But of course the roots also go down to the bottom. So it doesn't matter so much what happens up the, the top of the soil once the plants are established. And I did use food colour when I, I did some experiments, which I haven't shown the results of here, looking at uh, wicking in perlite, and food colour worked very well for that. Um, maybe I could find a dark enough colour that would make a difference in the cocoa peat. 
So having done those experiments uh, in the laboratory or in my workshop, in isolation of wicking beds, I then went out and, and built some wicking beds, built a polytunnel and put some wicking beds in it. And I'm not sure how many honours students start off by building their whole research facility, but that's what I did. So I, I did, the wicking beds were, I made in IBCs that I cut in half. Um, and then I put a divider across the middle of each wicking bed, which is what these, these green things are. That's the top of the divider that goes all the way down to the, the bottom of the wicking bed. My hope had been that I'd be able to waterproof that join well enough that it would keep the two halves of the bed separate. But in the end, that um, the waterproofing wasn't 100% successful. So I ended up uh, putting some pond liner in the inside the wicking beds. So if I was just using full IBCs, you wouldn't have to do that. Uh, but because I was trying to get more beds to experiment with and I didn't have the funds or the space to do 16 full beds with IBCs, um, it was, uh, an IBC is an intermediate bulk container. They're these plastic cubes with steel cages around them that are used to transport all sorts of chemicals all around the world. Um, you can buy them secondhand because they're generally um, used just one time for their original purpose. You need to make sure you're getting one that's had some food, food grade product in it because uh, they also use them for selling glyphosate and all sorts of nasty chemicals come in them. But they're, they're pretty freely available at rural stores um, and on Gumtree and places like that. So my construction was, was pretty much like the, the first diagram that I showed. The only real difference was instead of having an overflow pipe that came out at the top of the reservoir, I put the overflow, a hole for the overflow pipe in the bottom of the reservoir and then put a clear plastic tube coming up to level with the top of the reservoir so that the water would still overflow when it got to the top of the reservoir, but I'd be able to see how much water was in there. That worked really well for the beds that had a lot of free water in them, so gravel and uh, the water ups products. But for the sand and the cocoa peat I used in, in the reservoir, that tended to hold onto the water quite tightly. So um, imagine if you've got a, a bucket of sand you fill with water and then you drain all the water out of it. When no more water drips, drips out of it, the sand is still quite wet. So it's the sand particles are actually holding onto the water. So what I was finding was that the level in my indicator tube would drop quite quickly as the free water in the, the reservoir was used up but there would actually still be lots of water in the reservoir. So it wasn't a very good indicator for, for those beds. But where I had gravel beds or water ups in the, the reservoir layer, that gave me a really good indication of, of how, what the level of the water was. So what I, what I used in the growing medium was this cocoa peat mix that I, I based on some research that had been done in universities in America uh, 40 or 50 years ago about um, soil mixes for growing in containers. Uh, and it was six parts of cocoa peat, one part of compost that was just uh, from our council, the urban green waste uh, compost, and one part of washed sand. And uh, so that was just by volume. I just mixed those together in a concrete mixer and then put it into the beds. And I did add some uh, fertilizer into that. I don't know, I didn't measure how what nutrients were in the compost, but I wanted to make sure there were plenty of nutrients for in there for so that that wasn't going to affect the, the growth of the plants. What I did down in the reservoir layer, I had five different things that I, I tried. The first was just having the cocoa peat mix. So there was cocoa peat mix in the reservoir and cocoa peat mix up in the the growing medium layer, and there was no geotextile between them. It was just 500 millimetres depth of, of the cocoa peat mix all the way down. The second one I did was the, the crushed gravel. 
Um, and for that, I did put a, a geotextile layer between the gravel and the and the uh, cocoa peat mix on top, so that the two didn't didn't mix together. That's a pretty common design that's out there on the internet and on YouTube, and all over the place. I did the same thing with sand, so I had sand in the reservoir, uh, and then a layer of geotextile, and then the cocoa peat mix on top. And the final treatment I did in the uh, in the reservoir layer was a product called Water Ups that's been developed in Australia, made from recycled plastic. And the Water Ups people generously donated the, a box full of these to me so I could use them for my experiments. So they're basically, a, it's like a plastic shelf with hollow legs and you sit them in the reservoir of the wicking bed, fill up the legs with something that's going to wick the water up and then put the soil on top. So you've got lots of, free water around in the bottom of the reservoir and um, a number of areas where water can wick up. So those are 400 millimetres square. And then the, uh, the legs are about, I think from memory, about 75 millimetres square. Are they, water ups people said, uh, suggested using perlite in as the wicking ma material. Uh, and I did that first, but um, I did some experiments with perlite after this, this was not working too well. And you really need to use a fine grade perlite with as smaller particles as possible because I put in a medium grade, which was what the aquaponics shop sold me when I didn't really know anything about perlite. And that didn't, turned out that didn't wick very well at all. So the first round of experiments I did with water ups, I don't think really gave a, a good result of what they could do. For the second round of experiments, I took out the perlite and put in sand instead. And, and as we'll see in a little bit, that worked much better. The fifth treatment I did, um, there were, was a, a question asked to me by my supervisors about how did I know that the cocoa peat mix was going to be a good growing medium. And they suggested that maybe I should compare that with a commercial potting mix. So I did wash sand in the reservoir, the same as I'd done with one of the, with the third uh, treatment for the cocoa peat mix. But I used this potting mix that I bought from Bunnings. So it wasn't the cheapest one around. I think it probably wasn't the, uh, the most expensive one, but it certainly was a you know, quite reasonable quality potting mix. So I had five different treatments with the four reservoirs and the two growing media. And I did three copies of each of those so that um, I wasn't just getting a one-off result and I could compare the, the three different results with the same treatment and see if they were really telling me the same story. And I allocated the position of those 15 beds randomly to the um, beds I had in the, the polytunnel so that there wasn't any um, you know, if there was any effect from being near the end of the polytunnel or being on one side compared to on the other side, that I could you know, use statistics to, to identify whether that was causing any problems and, and be able to, to deal with it. So the results I'm going to show are the averages of, of three treatments. Some of the beds with the same treatment did a little bit better, some of them did a little bit worse, but um, what I'm showing you is, is the averages. So to get the water into the, the bed, I had a bit of 50 millimetre diameter slotted ag pipe that I laid across the bottom of the bed. Um, and then that was going into a, a PVC pipe that was my fill tube. Sorry. Uh, and then that's just a picture of the geotextile sitting on top of uh, the gravel before I put the, the, co the cocoa peat mix on top. As it turned out for where you've just got all sand in the, in the wicking bed, just having one pipe down the middle made it quite slow to fill up the, uh, the beds with water again. And just for making it easier to fill, it would have been better to have uh, more, more water pipe, more slotted egg pipe in, in the bottom of the beds. The photo on the left is just a, 
the, showing you the uh, plastic tube I had up for the overflow and how you could see the, the water level in there. And in each bed, I put in a tensiometer, which measures the, the soil moisture. Uh, so I, as things were growing, as I was adding water to the beds, I measured how much water I was putting in. I measured what was happening with the soil moisture. Uh, and those tensiometers were linked to a little data logger that uh, recorded the soil moisture every hour. Uh, I also used, a, I haven't got a picture of it, but a, a meter called a pulse meter that's made by a company in New Zealand that is just two probes, two steel spikes. You stick in the, um, into the growing medium and it will give you the, the soil moisture as well as temperature and electrical conductivity. But it's, it seems to be a fairly accurate tool. I think it's, I had a look at the sort of cheap water moisture meters that you can buy from hardware stores, garden stores, and I'm not sure that they're particularly accurate. Um, but this one was, was not very cheap, but it, it got, let, let me do measurements at various levels down the, uh, through the soil profile while they, the tensiometers were just sitting at one level, 150 millimeters down from the top. So I grew two different crops. The first one I did was I put um, spinach in all the beds and that was just a photo from one of the beds of the progressive growth of the spinach. And then for the second round of experiments, I grew lettuce, a little buttercrisp lettuces. And for both experiments, I had 12 plants in each bed. So the beds are about a metre by half a metre. So it was, was reasonably close spacing uh, for the plants. There was a question uh, from Kate, do the plant roots assist in wicking action? Um, I'm not sure that they help with the wicking, but they certainly will go down and, and draw up water. So once the, once the roots get down uh, towards where the reservoir is, the, the wicking through the soil doesn't matter quite as much because the, the roots will go down and, and get the water. But certainly as the more shallow rooted crop and the, the younger the crop, the more important the, the wicking action is in the, um, in the growing medium. So the results from my first experiment um, where I was growing spinach, I, I weighed all, I dried the plants and weighed them at the end. Um, unfortunately, scientists seem to like comparing the dry weight of plants um, because you know, it gives you, stops you sort of artificially pumping things up with water and, and uh, getting heavier plants. If you, you do a dry weight that allows you to, to combine the results from different trials at, at different times where the plants may have absorbed different amounts of water. But it means they grow all these beautiful plants and then couldn't eat them. But the, um, the cocoa peat and sand reservoirs did grow the heaviest plants. So it grew the most spinach. Um, the sand and potting mix grew the, the least amount of spinach and the gravel and water ups ones were sort of somewhere in between. So there's, there's a fair difference there between the, uh, the cocoa peat sand and, and the gravel one. Uh, and, and also I haven't, haven't shown you the graph, but I, I measured how much water was, uh, was put into the, I used to refill the beds and, and the more water I added so that was the more water that was used by the plants, the, the heavier the plants were. So that's, that's hardly surprising results, but it's, I guess it's, it's useful to know that there is that correlation. I did the same for the lettuces. And they, were, they were looking quite fine lettuces. It was very hard to, to dry them. But across all the 15 beds, there was no significant difference in the weight of the lettuces. They all weighed about the same. Um, I think the lettuce is a, a fairly fast growing crop. And I started off with the growing medium in the soil, in the wicking beds completely saturated. So what I did was fill up the reservoir, water from on top of the, uh, water the top of the soil until the water came out of the overflow so that they were all evenly saturated to start with. 
And I think there was probably just about enough water in the uh, cocoa peat mix to grow the lettuces, even without having to use any from the, or not much from the reservoir. So it wasn't a, a particularly good test to identify differences, but I guess it did show that depending on what crop you're wanting to grow, it perhaps doesn't matter too much what you do down in the reservoir layer of the wicking bed. But when I looked at, at what was happening with the soil moisture, there, there was some interesting stuff. So this was the readings from the tensiometer that was sitting halfway down the, the soil. And so you can see that the, the soil moisture starts off, that's where the soil's pretty wet, almost um, what they call field capacity, which is where it's as wet as it can be with after all the free water's drained out. And then as time goes by, the soil starts to dry out. And then when I filled up the reservoirs again, the soil absorbed water and, and got wetter. Now the red line is, is the gravel. So after about 20 days, the soil in the bed for the gravel started to dry out quite dramatically. And it got far drier than any of the other reservoir treatments. Um, the blue one is the one with cocoa peat in the reservoir, the purple one's the one with the sand in the reservoir and potting mix. And those dried out a bit, but not nearly as much as, as the gravel reservoir. The green one is the sand in the reservoir with cocoa peat as the growing medium. And that dried out more than the one with the potting mix, but I'll explain what I think is going on there in a little while, I'll just leave you uh, waiting for that. Uh, this brown line is the water ups, which you can see dry, took a little bit longer to dry out than the uh, gravel one did, but dried almost as much as the gravel. Now, that was quite a surprise to me, but I did find out that that was because the perlite wasn't wicking very well. And we'll see when we look at the, the next results uh, that the uh, water ups did much better when they had sand in the as the wicking material. So this was from the second experiment, growing, growing lettuce. And the brown line again is the water ups. And you can see that the soil moisture uh, halfway down the, the depth of the growing medium with the water ups hardly changed at all. It stayed reasonably quite wet, very constantly wet. And the, um, the blue one is the cocoa peat, where it was cocoa peat all the way down to the bottom, that similarly stayed quite wet. The one with the sand um, was fairly similar to the, uh, the first experiment and the gravel one, the red one, that dried out more than the others, but didn't get nearly as dry as, the, as it did with the spinach. But the, the lettuce was not in there for as long. Uh, it was a much faster growing crop. Uh, also the weather, wasn't nearly as hot when I was growing the lettuces as, as when I was growing the spinach. Um, so it, it didn't dry out as much. This time, the, the purple line, this one, the, which was the uh, sand in the reservoir with potting mix as the growing medium, that dried out as much as the gravel in this one. So it was quite a different result to what I got first time. And very soon we'll find out why. <laughs> so it's just putting the, the two graphs from the, the spinach trial and the lettuce trial just on the, the same slides here. You can see both of them. It, you know, and there's a similar pattern apart from the, uh, the water ups, which there's an explanation for, and the uh, potting mix one, which there will be an explanation for, the cocoa peat and the sand and the gravel reservoirs behave pretty similarly in, in both experiments. So this is the explanation for the potty mix. This is looking at the soil moisture at three different levels. So the red one is 50 millimetres down from the surface. The green one's 100 millimetres down from the surface and the blue one's 200 millimetres down. So that's almost 
So the, the growing medium was about 250 millimetres deep. So that's the blue ones almost right down at the water reservoir, but not quite. So you can see that the, the top, the surface of the, the wicking beds was quite a lot drier than, than further down. So there would have been evaporation happening from the surface. I didn't have any um, mulch on the, on the surface in these. I just left the top of the, the growing medium exposed. Um, so that sort of explains why the, why the top is quite dry. The middle layer um, starts off quite wet and then dried out and then re-wet as after I filled up the reservoir. With the cocoa peat, the um, bottom one, I only started measurements there because it was, was off the scale. It was right up, it was so wet right at the beginning. But you can see it dried out more than the middle layer did, but then it re-wet very well after, um, after I refilled the reservoir. On the one with the potting mix, the bottom layer stayed pretty wet, pretty constantly. The top layer was very dry and the middle layer was, it got drier than, than it did with the uh, cocoa peat mix. So the potting mix was not wicking very well. The water was just going into the bottom of it, but then wasn't moving up through the profile to, to the roots above. So, you know, I think potting mix is designed to drain when you uh, have it, you know, it's normal use, you water from on top and you don't want it to retain too much water. So the water flows out the bottom. It's not designed to wick very well. So I think that um, something with finer material than you get in your average potting mix is a better growing medium. Uh, at least that's what it appears from, from the work I've done. The second lot or the third lot of experiments I did was just some little wicking beds that I made in a bucket to get them 500 millimetres deep. I used a bit of plastic damp coarse material to put an extension on top of the buckets and they had a little uh, filler pipe coming down and an overflow pipe, just the same, but they were you know, much smaller units. I could have more of them in, in a smaller area. And I just grew one plant in, in each of these wicking beds. What I wanted to look at with these was just whether geotextile had any effect on the wicking. So I, I could compare the, these results with the ones from the big wicking beds. So I did cocoa peat mix with no geotextile all the way down as I did in the, the other bed. I did cocoa peat with a layer of geotextile in between uh, so there was cocoa peat in the growing medium, geotextile, then cocoa peat in the reservoir. And you know, I did one with sand in the reservoir and cocoa peat on top, but no geotextile. So that was different to what I'd done in the, in the um, big wicking beds. And I did three of each of those. So again, I could see whether there was uh, any one, one bed was, was performing unusually. The results from that was there was no differences. So the, geotextile didn't affect the, wick, the movement of water through the beds. Now there may be reasons to use geotextile to stop the soil mixing with whatever you've got in the, uh, in the, growing, in the reservoir layer, but it certainly doesn't have any adverse effect on, the, on the, um, the movement of water through the wicking beds. And that also showed me that these little wicking beds are a, a useful unit for experimenting in. I'm not sure you'd really want to grow a lot of crops in them because they're a bit small. But for doing experiments where you want a lot of replicates and try a lot of different variations, uh, they'd be quite good for further research. So some of the conclusions I've got, things that I really found from this was the capillary rise is greater in fine materials and coarse materials. So you get water will rise up better when the material is finer. Um, and the movement of water from the reservoir to the, um, into the soil was lowest with gravel and it was best with uh, the uh, cocoa peat or the uh, water ups. The soil in the gravel, I showed you that graph where the soil moisture went way down with the gravel. There was still a lot of water in the reservoir. So looking at the 
the plastic tube up the side of the uh, of the wicking bed, the water had dropped about 120 millimetres. So the reservoir was 200 millimetres deep. So the reservoir was still half full of water, but the water wasn't moving from there up through the gravel into the um, soil, which was what I thought would happen with those. But now I've shown that that uh, that does happen. So if you really want to use gravel in in a in a reservoir, it's not worth having it any more than about 100 millimetres deep. Um, or if it's deeper, you're going to have water at the bottom that never gets used, and you just have to refill more often than you might think you would. And based on the the um, capillary rise experiments I did in the tubes, I wouldn't use scoria at all. You know, I really don't think scoria would work very well in the, the reservoir of a wicking bed. So the reservoir affected the spinach weights, but not the lettuce, as I said. So for a, a quick growing crop, it probably doesn't matter too much what you do. I think for longer term crops, uh, tomatoes or perennial things, uh, you would find that there was more difference between different reservoir materials um, or you would have to water a lot more often with some reservoirs than, than some others. So the best soil moisture I got was with cocoa peat in the reservoir or the water ups with the sand. And the water ups with the sand wick better than just having sand on its own. Now I'm presuming that that is because in the water ups, there's a little bit of sand that's surrounded by free water. So the sand itself will, while it does wick water up through the sand into the soil, the sand also holds onto the water a bit. So by having less distance from the free water to go through sand to get up to the, the soil, I think more water is, is wicking up there. So I would suspect that a reservoir that's got lots of large voids to full of water with just some wicks of sand uh, would be good. So you could do that by having a big coil of, of ag pipe in, in the bottom of the wicking bed. So there was a lot of area in there where, where water could be. Or there's a couple of other beds which I've built but haven't really done any formal experiments with yet. Um, the, these ones I did with a sheet of core flute that I cut holes in and then put 100 millimetre diameter ag pipe in, filled that up with sand and then put the cocoa peat mix on top. The other one I've tried one of my, my outdoor beds, I've just used 140 millimetre pots that have got little holes in the bottom, filled those with sand so the water will come through the holes and wick up through the pots. And then I just covered the top of the pots with uh, some mesh and then geotextile on top of that to stop the, all the soil falling down into the, into the water. Uh, they seem to be working fine, but I haven't done any, any formal measurements on those yet. On the question of geotextile, I don't believe geotextile affects the wicking one way or the other. Um, interesting, I did find that the roots of the plants will grow through geotextile. When I disassembled some of the beds, uh, there were lots of roots that had gone through. So the roots will go down and, and find water. Um, anyway, um, you know, so geotextile isn't keeping roots out of the, out of the reservoir. Is geotextile needed? Maybe if you've got some coarse material like gravel in your reservoir, um, the uh, geotextile would, would keep your soil out of it. But I suspect that the reservoir would actually wick better if the, the soil fell down and filled up the gaps between the gravel. <laughs> That's my take on it. Um, I've, I've done beds for, for a long time where I've just done a coil of ag pipe in the bottom and put a mix of soil and compost all the way up so the bottom of it's been totally saturated and then the top of it's drier but there's no geotextile in between the roots go down as far as they want now i've not done formal measurements on those beds but um they're dead simple to make there's no not a lot of materials and they seem to to work quite well and i guess that's what i was emulating with the the beds that i had that just had cocoa peat 
uh, all the way from the, the top down to the bottom. One of the things people wonder about if you've got soil layer that's totally saturated in the reservoir layer, is it going to um, go anaerobic and, and become yucky? I haven't had that problem. Some of the beds that, that I've had that have had soil and compost in for probably five or six years, then I dug them up and the soil down the bottom was beautifully structured. It had nice poor spaces in that had reasonable number of roots had grown in it and didn't seem to have suffered at all by being flooded a fair bit of the time in the reservoir. But again, I haven't done any formal measurements of, of a long-term experiment like that. So potty mix, um, I found it didn't work as well as the cocoa peat. And I think that um, there's probably more work to be done on what's the best growing medium um, to use. And that's all for the future. Then what, one of the other, the sidelights of, of what I did, the question is how often do you need to water wicking beds? And I read things from, I only need to water them every couple of days to, you know, I water them once a week. Um, my general experience was I, I watered far less frequently than that. With the beds in this experiment, I put seedlings in and I watered them for the first five days only. So I think I watered them out four times in five days and then I, I left them be. The spinach, I, I didn't need to add any more water for almost a month. And then another 20 days after that, I added water again. The lettuce, uh, it was well over a month before I needed to do the first watering. And then I, I did a top up watering because uh, some of the beds needed it uh, another 10 days later. The table there shows um, when the soil moisture dropped to below minus 20 kilopascals, which is a, a measure that's used in the, um, the hydroponics industry as that saying pretty dry. They, they keep generally keep the, the medium well above minus 20 kilopascals of, of pre that's the pressure the plants need to exert to draw water out of the soil. Um, but that's still pretty wet compared to the way the soil moisture that's in most garden beds. But the number of days that it took to drop down to that level um, in all cases was well over a month. So, you know, I think the, the, um, the wicking beds from when you put the small plants in um, don't need to be watered very often at all. I, I did some measurements of after I finished the, the lettuce experiment, I put tomatoes in the greenhouse and I watered those first time 39 days after I transplanted them and then through the heat of summer with large vigorous tomato plants fairly crowded in those beds, it was an average of about once a week that I needed to water. So it, you know, it wasn't that often, certainly a lot less water than you'd, you'd water normal raised beds with tomatoes in them. That's the, uh, the end of what I've got to say. If you're interested in reading the full thesis that I've written, uh, if you can, or if you, you need something to send you to sleep, I've uh, put it up on my website, which is rugerly.com, uh, and Alex will send out an email in the next couple of days. It's got a link to that as well. So I'm happy to take any questions people have. I'll just sort of scroll through the... Hey, Chris, did you want to, um, oh, you can leave your screen share on or take it off. You can take it off. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, so I guess um, just one thing I did want to mention, Chris, was that um, Megan, um, Professor, Professor Megan Smith, the Executive Dean from the Faculty of Science and Health, um, was actually online. I just didn't see her. Um, and she's from the Charles Sturt University. She just wanted to um, wish you all the best and congratulate you on the research um, because I know that you haven't actually been able to have a graduation set ceremony because of what's happened with COVID and everything like that. So um, congratulations. 
Um, and I think that tonight's webinar is a really wonderful, um, you know, um, thing that you've done and, and it really sort of puts into focus all of that um, talk about wicking beds and actually what the science is telling us. So thank you. Thank you. And Thanks, thank me. you for volunteering tonight and to sharing all of that wonderful information with everyone as well. So we will move on to the questions now. Um, and so one is, is, do you think we know everything about wicking beds or do you still think there's more work to do? I think, I think I've really just scratched the surface of, of wiki beds and um, there could probably be several more lifetimes of, of research. And I, I've mentioned some of the things that I think it still would be worth doing, um, particularly looking at the growing medium and what's the best growing medium to, to use in wicking beds. Um, I think it will be interesting to work out how you know when to water wicking beds, given that with most of the wicking beds, you can't actually see how much water is left in. Do you, you know, is there a, a soil moisture measurement that's the right one to, right, um, to do? Is there an advantage in letting them drying out occasionally? That sort of thing. There's um, a lot of questions I've got around that. And the other thing, I, which I think we touched on earlier with hydroponics is I see wicking beds as you know, in some ways it's similar to hydroponics but it's a lot less energy input than most hydroponic setups and um, I'd like to be able to get nutrient cycling happening so it's you know closer to organic growing so you you're putting in compost you've got earthworms in there you've got bacteria in there that are uh, cycling the nutrients yeah and can you can you operate a wicking bed in that way so that you, you're getting all that nutrient cycling, you're not having to put in too many external inputs other than, than compost? Um, but can you get the same sort of production out as you do out of a, a commercial hydroponic setup? You know, and I think that could be quite exciting for, for urban farms, particularly in the future, if we could really nail, nail that one. Yeah. So I think the where we were up to, Chris, was um, Peter Monday, Sorry, Peter um, asked, what is the brand of moisture meter from New Zealand that you it's, use? It's called called Pulse, P-U-L-S-E. Um, okay. I can I can give Alex a link to when she sends out the email. Okay. She can, and can Jan asked. That. <clears throat> great. Thanks, Chris. Jan asked, um, I don't know whether you've got any experience with um, wicking beds and ring culture. Um, have you have you had any experience with that at all, Chris? No, I don't know what ring culture is. is there... All right, so we we'll, we might leave that one. Um, there was a few comments about the um, about the medium you use, Chris, cocoa peat. Um, just tell us, tell us what that is and, and where you sourced it and that sort of thing. There's, there was a comment that, you know, was, yeah, just tell yeah, us what yeah. it is. So, so it, it is the, the outer husk of the, the coconut. So it's a byproduct of the, the coconut industry. Mm. Um, you use as a, a waste product from there. Most of it, all of it, I think, is imported. A lot comes from Sri Lanka, I think, but it comes in compressed blocks. Um, so that it's you know, pretty efficient to, to transport and then you put it in water and soak it and it really swells up to six or seven times the, the, size, the size of the block. Um, it's used uh, quite a bit as a, an alternative to peat moss, which is you know, a bit environmentally unfriendly as harvesting the, the peat okay. moss. Okay. So for... Um... There's a question here about young plants. Um, I think you've sort of answered that in your in your presentation, but do you recommend watering from the top to help the roots establish, or did you just do that saturation watering at the start? Um, and then I noticed you said you'd left some for 39 days, so you didn't do any other watering? Um, I, I, I did water them for five days, or I think four times over five days at the start with about a cup full of water per plant. So it wasn't a huge amount of water, but I think it, 
Um, yeah. I, I did notice the spinach plants seedlings I put in were really tiny and, and quite weak and they did start to wilt a little bit. So I did need to water those. Yeah, but I've read some people saying water them for the first two or three weeks. I certainly found that um, certainly inside the polytunnel, you know, five days was, was plenty to, you know, adding about a, a litre of water over those five days was per plant was, was plenty. If they were outdoors in the wind, um, maybe they'd need a bit more, but I think the roots get down pretty quickly. Okay. So the next one is, um, have you tried, oh, this isn't really related to wicking beds, but have you tried koi um, mixed in with, with a vegetable garden mix? That, would that have been pretty similar to what you used or? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I know it's, uh, I have read about people that are using it to add a, organic material to, to condition soils and it doesn't tend to break down too quickly. So it, it provides quite a lot of structure for, for quite a while. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's a useful product in, in that way as well. Okay. It, it's also used in, in um, aquaponic setups as the growing medium, just, just cocoa peat coir on, on its own uh, that they, they then add nutrient filled water to. Okay. So um, given that water ups have an air gap that lets sodden, sodden water drip back into the reservoir, would we expect less wicking height and rate from them? Um, um, I don't think so. I mean, any, any reservoir, you know, a gravel reservoir is going to have an air gap, have in the spaces between the gravel once once the water starts dropping. Um, you know, I think the the wicking up through the the sand legs of the water ups won't, you know, it will happen just the same whether the, the reservoir is almost completely full or almost completely empty. And the uh, draining of water back into it won't um, wouldn't affect things at all. I, I read of one one paper where someone described a system that was really like a, a wicking bed with um, out any meat without any medium in the uh, in the reservoir. They just had plants growing in a little basket that was suspended above the above the a tub of containing water water with nutrients in it, and the plants used the used the water and the water level dropped and the roots kept growing down, so they stayed in the water. Um, and that was, you know, so there was an air gap between the water and and the the plant that was had roots going through it, and they grew quite happily. So I'm not sure air gaps are a big issue. Okay. So there's a question here from Ricky, um, just about did the potting mix have compost added or just or just the cocoa peat mix? Yeah. So, so do you that, think that could have influenced the way that it performed? Yeah. So the so the cocoa peat. The compost was was just plain compost as it came out of the bag, um, and the cocoa mm. peat mix had cocoa peat compost and sand. But yeah. um, the co the potting mix had a, a fair amount of fertilizer in it, and uh, then I added a bit of fertilizer to the the cocoa peat mix as well. So you know I think that there was enough nutrient in both growing mediums that it that wasn't going to affect. How, how the plants grew. Yeah. But, but adding adding compost, which was was quite a fine compost, it was really well sieved, so it was all just small particles. Okay. I think if you added 20% maybe compost into that potting mix, that would have filled up all the little gaps in there and it, it, would, it probably would have worked better. Okay. So there's some questions here about the medium. What what would you suggest is the best from um, medium to use in wicking beds, um, um, in terms of you know the growing medium? What would you suggest? Yeah. Um, I've had good results just getting soil from the garden and um, compost and mixing that sort of fifty fifty. 
Uh, the, the cocoa, peat, compost and sand mix worked very well, uh, but it's probably not a, not a very cheap thing to do if, if you're doing a lot. Um, I've had very mixed results. I haven't done a lot of formal experiments, but I did a, a couple early on with a, some soil mixes from a, a soil yard. And like, well, there was a veggie mix and a, a premium soil mix and something else. But there was a lot of variation in the, the particle size in them. A lot of some of them had composted bark that wasn't very composted in, and they didn't tend to wick very well. So I, you know, I think um, you can try a fairly simple experiment if you can get a a tube or um, make a tube out of um, acetate or thick plastic. If you, if you can wrap it into a tube, put rubber bands around it, fill it up with whatever soil you think you might use, sit that in a container of water and just see whether the water comes up through it. Okay, um, you know, before spending a lot of money on getting soil from a, a soil yard, that would be a fairly simple experiment to do with you know, just a, a little bucket of soil. Yeah. Um, but you, know, you need to have something that, that hasn't got a lot of air gaps in it, that's you know, got a quite, quite a few fine particles. In there. Right. So um, I'm just going down to um, you touched on the condition of the water in the reservoir um, and did it tend to go off or anaerobic? And was there any concern? Do you need to flush out or clean the reservoir between plantings? Um, I haven't found that to be a problem. I mean, these was, this was growing two crops over about five months, so it wasn't really a very long-term experiment. But you know, I've never had any problem with wicking bed starting to smell or anything apparently nasty happening in the water that's that's affected the the growing. So you know that hasn't been my experience, but that's not to say in longer term that it wouldn't. You know, I can't say that definitely it wouldn't be necessary to drain it all out, but I don't think so. Yeah. So. Um... There's a question there about if you're setting up in a place where you can't water often, could you have a higher, taller refill pipe um, on your wicking bed? Uh, if the, no matter how tall the refill pipe is, once the water level in that pipe goes above the overflow yeah. level of your overflow, it's, it's going to come out. It's going to come out um, anyway. So it really would just <clears throat> is have a have a bigger reservoir if you can water yeah. that. So, yeah. you know, and I found <clears throat> the sand in, in the Perspex tubes, water would happily wick up the sand at least 30 centimetres fairly quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I think if you had a, had a reservoir that was something like the water ups or you know, the, those other ones I showed you that I was doing with the, the pots, you could have a deeper reservoir, you could have a, a 30 centimetre deep reservoir with sand wicks in there, and then you could put a lot more water in that than you could put in a shallower reservoir. So, so with want... those ones that you use the pots with, and um, yeah, I saw the pots with the sand in them, and then the um, you had a bit of what mesh over the top. Yeah. Did you use geotextile fabric on the top of those to yes. stop the the um, the reservoir from being contaminated? Well, it, it was. Yeah, because because there's all these gaps between the yeah the, the roots and yeah, so I, so I did put geotextile on that to to stop the the soil falling down in there. So yeah, I, and was was it effective at doing that? I no. haven't I haven't dug it up to see, but I I don't see why it it wouldn't yeah. be effective. I you know I think it I think it would be fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, Oh, do you fertilise the water in the reservoir or in the growing medium? So I was just relying on um, the uh, fertiliser that was in the growing medium. I've never tried putting fertiliser in the in the water. Um, I think it would probably work okay. What the long term effects of that would be, I don't know. One one of the questions that I did ask early on that I did look at was whether 
having this water that was constantly moving up through the growing medium, and then some of it evaporating from the surface, where that would lead a build up to a build up of salt on the surface of the growing medium. Because mm -hmm. one of the, one of the um, things that happens in, in commercial horticulture sometimes is that when you're doing a lot of irrigation, you get um, build up of salts on the surface. And sometimes they do a whole lot of over irrigation to actually flush all those salts out. Yes. Yeah. At the bottom of the soil. But yeah. I, I did measure the electrical conductivity, which is the uh, a measure of the level of salts in the in the medium. And I didn't over the five months that I was growing things and measuring it, I didn't see any increase in in salt on the surface. But I wonder if you had these salts, the fertilizers dissolved in the water, if that may become a, more of a problem in the yeah. water. It would certainly be something to to watch out for. Okay, so there's just a question here um, from Tiffany about, do you postulate a prime size for a wicking bed container? Say, for example, could you have a half 4,000 litre rainwater tank cut in half? Would that be an effective container? Or you're not too sure? Um, <clears throat> I tell you, I've never used anything bigger than a bath or the IBC, which probably both about one square metre. I don't see any reason why a bigger one wouldn't work. Um, you yeah. need, to need to think about what depth you want, because um, certainly for, for growing veg annual veggies, um, having a total 500 millimetres deep with some 200 millimetres reservoir and 300 millimetres for the growing medium seems to work well. Um, if you have deeper than that, um, it's probably deeper than necessary for annual veggies, but for perennial plants, and uh, maybe more advantage, and it's more expensive if you're going to fill up a bigger one. So, but yeah. certainly as far as diameter goes, you know, I think it's not going to matter. It's okay. Smart. So there's just a question ar around um, the scoria and why... <clears throat> Why did you think it didn't work? Is it due to the size of the material or was it something to do with the actual material itself? I, I think it's um, it's mostly the size of the material that uh, the gaps between the scoria particles are just too big for capillary rise to happen in there. So in, in that way, it's similar to the crushed gravel, but the crushed gravel did wick better than the, the scoria. And what I think happens <clears throat> is that where the water's going up the gravel, it's actually just going up by adhesion to the surface of the gravel particles. It's not actually dragging other water molecules up with it in the spaces between the gravel particle because they're too big. Yeah. Scoria, which has got a really rough pitted surface, it's there's not as clear a path for the, the water to go up adhering to the surface of the scoria so that it, it doesn't go up very far at all. So, you know, I think yeah. it's a combination of those two things that mean the, the scoria wasn't wicking very well at all. Okay. So we've just got a couple of questions here about, um, um, there's one about where we would, would source bulk amounts of cocoa peat. Yeah. Um, um, have, have a look at suppliers to the commercial horticulture, commercial hydroponic industry. Yeah. Um, I bought it in blocks that were, oh, I can't remember the volume. They're, they're sort of about 30 yeah. centimetres square and 20 centimetres deep. Um, you know, and they're, they're, the, the commercial operations by those, by, by the pellet load. And so I'd be, be looking there. If you're going to buy it from, uh, Hammer Barn, one of the hardware shops or garden centres, it's cost you a fortune. But you know, yeah. if you're buying a large quantity, you should be able to get it yeah. through some um, wholesaler. So have you looked at um, commercial, the commercial wicking bed mix from BioGrow? No, I haven't. It would be interesting, okay. interesting to try that. Yeah. Oh, there was a question about whether you get salt build up from the cocoa peat, but you you just explained that wasn't really a problem. Yeah, because um, the cocoa peat 
it's it's often apparently washed in salt water as, as part of the processing in Sri Lanka or where it comes from. And I've read of concerns about it being too salty, but I've never, the stuff I've used so far, I've never had any problems with that. So, you know, yeah. certainly if you're buying a lot of cocoa peat, it would be worth asking a question. But, you know, I think cocoa peat that's being sold to commercial horticulture industry is, is probably going to have not have that problem. Yeah. So there's a pretty good question here from Jenny and John, I think, that says, some wicking beds, bed setups recommend a water retentive layer above the reservoir when, when you, and between the reservoir and your planting medium of approximately 30 centimetres. Would you recommend using cocoa peat or is it even necessary? Um, I haven't tried it, but I can't see why it would really be necessary. I think that the, the whatever growing medium you sh use <clears throat> should hold, be able to wick water and hold enough water for the, the plants to grow. Um, mm. And the roots are going to go down. Uh, once you've got enough water on top to get the plant started, the roots are going to go down to where the water is. Okay. Um, so there's a question there for the beds with the sand wicks. Do you need a soil barrier between the water reservoir and the growing medium, or was there a not was there a, already a plastic reservoir there, a uh, plastic barrier? Oh, with the with the water ups there is so the, there's the plastic unit there. Yeah. With, with the um, the ones I made, I had yeah. one of them. I had plastic um, core flute just a little stuff they use for signs like corrugated cardboard and plastic but that was just as a you know all it's got to do is support the grey medium that's above it um, and the the ones I did outside with the pots I just had the um, the geotextile providing that support you know, I don't think there's anything magic about having a, a particularly solid layer there as long as it's it's enough to stop the soil falling down into the water yeah so Kathy just asked, um, I'm just going to reassure Kathy that the webinar is being recorded um, and we will have a summary um, and a link to this webinar um, on our website when we when we publish the summary and, and that will be, um, I'll send that out, um, notification of that. I'll, I will actually send it out to this, to the people who've registered for this webinar. Um, and I will also put it into our newsletter that you can sign up for on our on our website. Yeah. Um, we've had another question there about scoria. I think we've sort of answered that. Yeah, um, I'll just say um, it's puzzled me a bit about scoria and gravel that it's used so much, and there are so many people that are happy with the way the wicking beds work with scoria and gravel. That there's there's something going on there that means they they do work at least to some extent and I've got a few theories that you know would be another project would be interesting to explore to really interview people about how they actually operate their wicking beds. I suspect sometimes there may be watering more often than would be otherwise necessary if the reservoir was wicking better. Maybe it's getting more water from on top than um, you would think would otherwise be necessary, certainly if they're out in the rain. And there's one curious thing that's it's a little bit counterintuitive, but if you've got a layer of soil and a layer of gravel underneath it, so the soil's got small pores in it and the gravel's got big pores, if the water, if the soil is saturated until it gets really, really oversaturated, water tends not to move from small pores into big pores. So if you get a whole lot of rain that comes on your wicking bed, it's going to saturate the soil, but not drain, a lot of it won't drain out into the gravel. So uh -huh. if there's, you know, rain once a week or even once every couple of weeks, you're probably getting that layer of soil wet enough for things to grow. And it doesn't matter what happens down in the in the reservoir layer. Okay. Um, uh, that's that's a bit of speculation, but you know that's yeah. Based on the physics of how water moves in between particles, it's it seems logical to me. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So there's just a question here from Mary about um, what your thoughts are on using dam water in wicking beds. 
Um, she's used it for a while and saw white scum coming out of the drain tube. She wondered if it might be toxic to the soil with too much bacteria from duck manure in the dam or something like that. It's not a problem. I've had all my wicking beds for the last 13 years have been watered with dam water from the, the dam on our farm, which certainly has a lot of ducks in it um, and other critters. So yeah, so dam water on per se is, is not a problem, but there's obviously something growing in those, in those reservoirs that's causing that. But I don't yeah. know what that would be. Okay. Um, so we've actually got about 50, 50 messages there. Um, I think we've really pretty much covered everything. Um, there was, there's one question there about, have you ever thought of using concrete premix being blue metal river sand and a fine sand and having the drain, a drainage sock around the ag pipe? Do you think that, like, that sounds like it's a fairly fine mix? Yeah, um, that would probably work okay. Um, just based on my capillary rise experiments, the crusher dust would probably be the best thing to use for wicking. I've read some people speculating that that would affect the pH of the soil, that the crusher dust is quite alkaline. I and you know, and that's probably that's what's in a lot of these concrete mixes as well. Mm. And, um, I just don't know about that. It's it's something I'd like to I'd like to try when I do um, <clears throat> use coils of um, ag pipe in in the reservoir. I often do have the geotextile sock around it to stop them filling up with with uh, sand or or soil. That right. I okay. That, I think that is necessary. Yeah. So um, there's just a question here about have you tried like a, a, a really high, well, I guess lettuce is fairly high water use, but have you tried zucchinis? And if so, do you need to water them more frequently? Perhaps you haven't tried zucchinis. Yeah, I, I haven't tried zucchinis. Um, I've grown rhubarb in wicking beds, which grows, grows quite happily. Um, but yeah, I think as you as you get a lot more leaf area and bigger leaves, you get a lot more transpiration. So you're going to have to um, add water more more frequently. Um, yeah. But yeah, so tomatoes that was watering once a week, the the um, spinach and lettuce was watering once a month. So yeah, so the the watering frequency does depend on what you're growing. Yeah, and. There's just uh, there's a question about do you suggest to use water ups or ag pipe with growing medium straight on top without geotextile? I think you were more or less suggesting that, weren't you? Um, sorry, water ups or <laughs> yeah, sorry. Do are you suggesting the use of water ups or ag pipe with growing medium straight on top without geotextile? Um. I think either of those works. The, um, the water ups are, are dead simple to use, um, and particularly if you're if you're constructing a wicking bed that's to the same dimensions as as the water ups things, or you can use them as a a uh, in whole units. I had to cut them down to make them fit in the IBC, but you know they seem to work well, and they're very simple and straightforward. But then they they do cost a bit to buy, and you know maybe able to do something simple, cheaper with ag pipe. But I think either of them would probably work work just as well. Okay. And and if you've got ag pipe, um, lots of ag pipe with with a geotextile sock around it, and you say filled up with sand to just to the top of the ag pipe, so you don't have to have a lot of sand above it. Uh, I just put the growing medium straight on top with. No more geotextile. Yeah, okay. So there, there was one person who just made the comment that they are doing some research as well um, and um, would like would like to you know to have a chat. So yep. Chris, I, if they if you would if that person could send me their details, I can definitely um, put you in touch. Certainly um, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, great. 
All right, Chris. Well, I'll just finish off with a few messages from the Small Farms Network and then we'll come back and wrap it up. Okay? Yep. Okay. Like, all right. So I just wanted to let you know um, about the Small Farms Network and how you can become a member. You can do that on our website um, and you can also find um, some resources or sign up for our free newsletter on our website. Um, if you like what we do, we encourage you to become a member so we can keep doing events like this one. Memberships, uh, mem members receive um, a lot of benefits, including early alerts for upcoming workshops, discounts for some events, opportunities to participate in special interest groups and members only events. And you can also submit notices relevant to small farms that can be advertised in our newsletter. So currently our members only groups, we've got a sheep, a sheep husbandry group, um, and we also have a small business group and they're currently meeting by Zoom and, and when COVID allows, we're hoping that we'll have some special um, events uh, in person as well. Um, we'd love to get your feedback about this session today. So when the Zoom session ends, you'll, you'll be directed to a survey link and it'd be great if you could fill that out for us. You can leave a comment in the chat box and you can also email me on the admin address. The Small Farms Network um, has a, um, a, a discussion group on Facebook and we are inviting you to, um, to join that um, discussion group if you'd like to talk about things all things small farms. Um, and that's where you can post your ideas and comments and also any pictures that you wanted to share from your property. And you can also like us on, this, on the main Small Farms Network Capital Region Facebook page. We also have recorded all of our webinars and um, we've done some other little special clips about small farms um, on our YouTube channel. Um, so we've got everything ranging from chickens, backyard chickens, right through to um, acid soils and, um, and sheep. Um, and that's a good place to catch up if you've missed any of our previous webinars. So, yep, that's our... Um, that's our details there with the Small Farms Network Capital Region on our website and Facebook. And um, we'd love to see you join us. All right, Chris, fantastic. That was a wonderful webinar. Thank, thank you, you so much for your time. And thank you everyone for all the interest in it. It's, it's very gratifying to see that people want to learn about this. Yeah, and if there was any questions that haven't been fully answered, um, we'll try and get those questions out to you, um, those answers out to you. You can always email me if there's anything we missed today and we'll try and get, the, um, to get those questions out to everyone. So thank you very much, Chris. Yes. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.